Yo, what's up? Welcome to the Journey to Pay Speaking Geeks podcast. And I am your host, Charles Clark. And today I have Jeff Butler on. And Jeff, uh, welcome to the show, man. So excited to have you on. Appreciate being here, Charles. Yeah, you know, we just learned something. We have a commonality, uh, athlete to athlete. Mm -hmm. And you you kind of know the, the hard work that it takes. And so I just want you to let the Thrive Tribe know a little bit about who you are. Who, who, who is mm -hmm. Jeff Butler? Yeah, well, Jeff Butler is someone who doesn't take care of his background for podcasts because it looks like I literally have all the stuff disorganized. <laughs> I actually use that stuff to roll out and uh, for athletics. So I'm just looking at my background. I'm like, dang, this dude lo looks like he's living like a bum. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, my name is Jeff. Uh, went to UC Berkeley. I do a lot of speaking now. I had a corporate background. I don't want to go into the story, but in terms of who I am, uh, keynote speaker on generations, workplace dynamics, anything from recruitment to retention, management, and the way that I actually was able to position myself as a younger speaker was going more from the angle of being younger and talking to people who are more in the C-suite or managers saying, hey, here's what people my age are looking for. Mm. That's initially how I got my segment in there. So as a speaker, that's what I am. But yeah. I don't know if you want me to go into existentially, spiritually, emotionally. Yeah, yeah, like, like, I don't know. We have don't have enough time for that. <laughs> that's the small speaker side. Yeah, you you have family. I do. Uh, well, I some family, but I don't have any kids. Uh, I have a girlfriend who definitely is ready to get married. So <laughs> could be a family thing. <laughs> that's what's up, man. Congratulations in advance. Mm -hmm. um, that that's that's pretty awesome. Finding love and and being loved. Uh, so tell me your story. Like, how did you get into the speaking industry? Because for somebody like me who was starting out as a speaker, I didn't know I could get paid for this. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so tell me the story of, of how you got into this and, and, and becoming a paid speaker. Short version, because speakers can talk forever. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I've UC Berkeley. I, like you, I, I had dreams of like doing the Olympic route of track and uh, I, I stepped away from it because of making sure I had like a career in place. I went to uh, software engineering, so I got a computer science degree from Cal. Mm -hmm. During that time, I worked in corporate as a software engineer. In addition, uh, started my own software company around 23 years old and after a year about doing doing that, I wasn't really thrilled. So I quit that, I didn't have any job or anything. And so I had a bucket list. Number eight on there was public speaking and there was a Toastmasters. I saw your website and obviously you went to Toastmasters as well. Yeah. So I, I went to Toastmasters having no experience. I'm a huge introvert. So I'm the guy who sits in the back of a classroom, puts their head up against the wall and looks like they're sleeping, but they're really trying to follow along. I'm that guy. <laughs> well, I show up and there's a table topics portion, which is, 60 yep. seconds to two minutes where you have to basically come up with a answer some question they ask you. I go up, I speak for 50 seconds, came and make it the full minute. I sit down. I'm like, I want to do this for a living. Wow. Like whatever this is, I want to do it. And, and later that day, I set a goal to get on TEDx. Uh, yeah. Four months later, I was four on the months. TEDx stage in Hilliard. And then it was a matter of how to make this a career how to actually get paid for it, which was very tough. I even had to go back to working full time to dilute or to push my cash into building the business. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, oh, it happened all at once. No, like right. even with a TED talk, it was very difficult. Yeah. And worked in there, tried youth. I saw you spoke to youth, which I don't know how you do it, but like high school kids will call you out and they don't care at all. <laughs> uh, way easier. <laughs> so I, I did that for a bit. Then went down the corporate route, paired up with a buddy who showed me how to do outreach, uh, build a sales process, build a sales team. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, uh, for we, when I paired up with him, I hit six figures the first year. Yeah. Um, not like 500,000. It was a hundred thousand. I made it. Next, I made it. it was <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. that's a big difference. Uh, and then from mm -hmm. there, each year doing a little bit better. Uh, obviously 2020 was a huge slap in the face. Uh, definitely had to figure out different income streams. And then uh, now, yeah, I'm doing 50 to 60 a year, uh, yeah. charging anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand up to 15. Yeah, for that's awesome, jobs. man. Congratulations. So, I, I love yep. seeing people win. Your, your win is my win. 
Uh, and, and so when did you know, like, this was something that that you know you can make a living doing? I, I know you talked about the Toastmasters and having that experience. Yeah. But was there ever a moment after that where maybe you were on a stage or maybe you were behind the scenes and you were like, this is it? This is this it's is not. I mean, those are two different questions, right? There's one yeah. when I think it was possible. Mm -hmm. And then the second was when I realized that I am doing my dream. Yeah. So those are two entirely different things. Um, I was not a very, like, didn't have a very utopian perspective on whether or not this is possible. It was more that I don't want to work in corporate, so I got to make this work. <laughs> like, that was my mindset. So I was willing to try anything, man. Yeah. I was going into different schools, like, ba being paid, like, barely anything, and the kids are yelling at me. Like, I went to, you know what alternative high school is? Mm -hmm. Yep. I went to alternative high school students and they straight up would start yelling at me in my wow. presentation. And I'm in like this freaking blazer. Like, they don't give a crap. That I'm in a blazer. <laughs> like, they're just like, screw you, dude. Some white dude walking to my school, tell me what's up. And I'm like, God damn, like, this is brutal. <laughs> Ego so, like, check, right? <laughs> yeah, but it was like do or die, mm. right? Like, I didn't care. Like, I was like, let's let's just let's make it work. Like, I, I don't, I'm not living long enough to really waste time doing something else. Wow. Let's figure out a way to make this happen. And it was a grind for those first few years, man, like barely earning anything. Like if, I don't know if you checked out my TED, TEDx talk at, yeah. on smartphones, that collared shirt was the only one I had. Those are the only pair of jeans I had. My glasses were completely scratched up. Like I was barely had any money at that time mm. trying to make that damn dream work, dude. And shine so, on the stage, right? <laughs> Yeah. And you know, in the comment section, man, people are ripping me a little bit. They're like, man, this is overly rehearsed. I'm like, dude, they don't know how many times I practiced that talk because wow. I was like, here's my one shot to get this nice footage on here at TEDx yeah. stage. <laughs> Screw the top. <laughs> I'm going to do this so many damn times. So I literally went to like 30 Toastmaster events, but back to your original point, it was do or die. It wasn't this, Hey, I'm going to, I'm doing my living. But mm -hmm. when I, and then there's a side of, can I do this for a living? Or is this possible? Am I living this dream? I don't really felt like I really hit that dream point mm -hmm. because probably like you, once I hit a certain number, I'm off to the next one. Like I'm pretty sure once you broke 21 seconds in the 200, you were like already thinking about 20.5. Well, break the world right then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or like 20, and then you're like, all right, let's, let's break 20.5. And you're like, can I break the 20 second mark? Yeah. Right. But that's kind of like the speaking side for me. Okay, great. I hit this mark. I'm looking at the next one. And part of that's a good thing. Part of that's bad. If you're looking at more traditional mainstream, like motivational talk these days, they would say that's a really bad thing because they say, oh, you're not satisfied with where you are. Mm -hmm. But existentially, we do need a purpose in order to withhold the stress and difficulties of reality and having a strong enough why and sort of looking at more Viktor Frankl in a sense of existentialism we do need something to find invigorating to go through stress. Yeah, uh, I th I definitely is the balance, right? You got this duality yes. of like being in the moment and then I, I want to live my legacy. I want the best <laughs> of the best, yeah. and, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, me being a, a competitive athlete, it transcends to, to my business as well. And so there's certain things that I don't like to compromise on. And and so I, I really like the fact that you said you were hungry, like you didn't yeah. want to compromise that. And so the question I ask you listeners today is where's your hunger? Like, do you do you really want to make a difference in people's lives? Uh, do, do you really feel like your message is something that can change the world or change one person? Because that hunger is going is going to take you through those difficult moments, those nights where you're not getting those emails or, you know, that you're getting those rejections again and again, and your, your calendar's not getting booked. Where, where's your hunger? Like that's, that's where you're going to find the success, right? Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, here's, here's my other question for you. I know you have a, a book out. It's called authentic workplace, uh, yes. how authenticity is creating the workplace for tomorrow. I know I don't know how big your team is, but uh, my question is is really like how are you using authenticity to build a successful speaking business? Oh, I thought you were going to say 
oh, I saw your book and I was wondering how big your team is because you only have two reviews on your book. <laughs> I thought you could lead in that way. I was like, all right, I see you. I see one. Oh, nothing. man. Um, you took no, it no, there, no, bro. Um, yeah, actually, in terms of authenticity, um, I actually wrote that book more as can I write something in corporate and take, try and take a bigger idea of what I'm seeing in the world. And the actual first chapter is kind of reflecting on what I've seen in terms of uh, my family tree on different managerial styles. So mm -hmm. I grew up in Silicon Valley. My parents were entrepreneurs. My grandfather also was an entrepreneur, uh, big risk taker. They yeah. both succeeded very well, but came from nothing on both yeah. sides. And in terms of authenticity on there, they did have different styles and how that translates to how I work with my team. I've had this a lot and it's more of how do you transparent and consistent with team members? For instance, you know, I had to fire someone recently. It was one of my most difficult firings. We have a team of around 15 mm -hmm. and this person has been with me through the pandemic. She was an amazing um, person, but we weren't aligned as much anymore. And I could just tell she wasn't as excited about the work. So, you know, we had to part ways mm -hmm. and people were curious, like, Hey, what, what happened? Right. Do you give the corporate answer and say, well, you know, things didn't work out well how do you but the, how do you not give so much information that you're being a jerk to yeah, that relationship yeah, right yeah, undermine yeah. that relationship so i was basically had to spell out a few things of like hey you know what we went through this this and this we had this conversation that didn't really work out and we decided to part ways mm -hmm. and if you are consistent on that side if they go over to the other person and say well what did he say if it matches it's like okay you did did the right thing there's that there's also um showing them how much revenue we're making there's also saying hey um here's how i actually feel about you mm -hmm. if they screw up i let them know if they do well i let them know yeah and a lot of that being able to give that polarity and dichotomy of those two different perspectives really goes a long way because they know, they know that they can get better but they also, they know that they're being seen as what they're also doing well in, right? So those mm -hmm. can both exist at the same time. Yeah. I, I like I like the approach of authenticity for you. I was I was expecting something completely different, but, you know, I, I, I really am, am seeing that authenticity is is all encompassing, right? It's mm -hmm. it, it what goes it what goes on behind the scenes um, and it's what you do on the stage as well. Uh, right. But, but the tr I guess the true authenticity is is what you do, like as a being. Like, is, is this a part uh, of your life? Yeah, I mean, part of that book though was looking at sort of the traditional definition of authenticity of being yourself, and that's actually not true. Because mm. if you were really yourself, you would basically be someone who looks like they have Tourette's, offending <laughs> everyone around you, which is not good. So I was looking yeah. at different dimensions of authenticity, and I even did that in this conversation. If you want to get meta. Mm -hmm. For instance, one of the things I demonstrated in there was that in conversations, there tends to be, you know, high like level of depth, right? If we say, oh, I had a, it's a very deep conversation, yeah. it's a level of depth that you have to go down. If we stayed more on your traditional podcast path, right, we would say, how's your speaking career? How's this? How's that? But if we branched off, and that's why I brought up your track thing, right. I knew it was a little off, but it was enough to build like rapport and say, okay, like this dude kind of gets me, understands the side, but I went a little bit deeper kind of outside of the path yeah. and I knew how to take that. So that's kind of a way of building rapport and you do that with an employee or yeah. normal conversations. It yeah. works well to appear more real. Yeah. I, I guess the ultimate, the ultimate thing that we, that we're doing when we're being authentic or trying to practice this authenticity is connection. Mm. You mean like connecting with just people as in they can trust you? Or that you can, people are, are hearing your your message guys, with your group, right? What do you uh, mean by that? I think in in any sense, um, any form of connection, not to get a result, but to connect, feel heard, and okay, yes, yeah, yeah. of course, okay, for sure. So especially with event planners, because you'll talk to a whole bunch of them, and you'll get to a lot of no's or someone who wants you, and they say, "Can we have you for free?" Mm -hmm. And maybe you cannot, but uh, but are you going to take the time to help them find the right person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right? later on, you know, you know, who knows what could happen? You don't know. So yeah. why would you be a jerk in that relationship, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it didn't line up to what you wanted. 
Mm. Yeah, but there's polite ways of going about it. But yeah. I, I just find it really annoying, especially in this space, as you know. Like you've done some things in sports, much more than I have. But I'm sure you ran into certain motivational speakers of some guy who's like, "Yeah, I played one year of uh, junior varsity football," and you're like, "Dude, then why are you talking about resilience? <laughs> what do you know about resilience, <laughs> right?" And then they have this attitude about them, this lack of humbleness. And you're like, mm -hmm. well, you know, like, I don't really agree with what, you know, it's like, right. falls down that line. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. So what, what, what would you say for you? What was the biggest challenge uh, on your journey of becoming a, a paid speaker? Uh, having a consistent marketing channel. I know you also wrote about your difficulties in writing and reading. Mm -hmm. I've, had my certain challenges because I didn't get into Cal off of academia. It was sports, right? So I had that chip on my shoulder when I graduated that I was not that smart and I was not capable. Yeah. So I had to learn how to write more effectively, which I mm -hmm. turned out to be a lot better of a writer than I thought, which is cool. Cause you but, had that drive and passion. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it was part of that, but also on the SAT, I scored really well on yeah. the essay and I thought it was a fluke. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe it. So I was like, Oh, Almost perfect score. Oh, who would have thought? But oh, wow. anyway, and, and a couple books later, mom, right? <laughs> well, no, all my mom, my mom edited my all my essays through um, high school. So imagine what that'll do to your ego, right? Mm. So, in terms of um, what was going back to the original question on there? Sorry, you got me biggest off. challenge. Yeah, I, I get I get lost all the time. Marketing <laughs> challenge. The marketing. Yeah. Uh -huh. 100%. Because in speaking, you can write a talk. You can be engaging. There's so many people who are better than me who can be funny or make an audience clap on command or get a standing ovation. But can you consistently get on stages for enough money to make this a successful business? Mm -hmm. That is hard. Yeah. That's very hard. And Did I don't you... want to undermine that. It's because obviously, who? why would people be joining your uh, the th uh, Rise and Thrive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why would people actually join that? It's because it's difficult. It's because it takes a lot of know-how. Yeah. Did did you ever find that it factor for you? Yes. In terms of marketing? Yes. I think it's different for everyone, right? Um, I can't do what you do to create success. Possibly I could, but I think mm -hmm. we all have our lane. Um, and so what, what was that for you that, that you said, hey, man, this is it. This is it for me. This is where I really need to focus on. Well, that that's more of is it that the industry that I went after or more the marketing channel? I'm more I'm more meant like marketing channel of what I did. And what I did is I did a lot of outbound sales. Mm -hmm. And what I thought is if I reached out to enough places, I put enough of them on my site, I got footage from those, I would build up the brand. And the next time, let's say if I used ads and then someone comes to my site, they're like, Oh, this is a big speaker. It's because I was able to do all of that legwork. Yeah. Yeah. The problem that I ran into was how can I send out that many emails, do that many calls? And it's that I didn't do it. I yeah. ended up hiring people mm -hmm. and I was paying people to do the emails, to do the calls. And that's where I ended up building the team. Yeah. Then from when I had the team, people started asking me how to do that. And that's why I started, I had started hiring different uh, booking agents for other speakers. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I got to see multiple people succeed in that same fashion. Yeah. And, I love that. But, Big and dumb though. It wasn't. It wasn't like I had a TikTok that went viral, or I was flexing my abs on Instagram, and then <laughs> all these all these event planners saw and they're like, "Oh, you're so cute. Come to our conference. We'll give you all the money you want for a lap dance." Or nothing like that happened. <laughs> it was just like really boring, repetitive stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's what it is. Like, you you need a you need a system. Like, I always yeah. say, if you do something more than once, uh, it needs a process. And, and mm -hmm. when you can define what you do as a process, that's when you truly have a business because, you know, speaking, uh, a speaking business is not just about getting on the stage. Uh, it's a lot of legwork. It's a lot of behind the scenes things that most people will never see, but they'll see that success on the stage. They'll see it on your right. website. Um, so, yeah, the great perspective on that. Uh, I, I know you talked a lot about the challenges, right? The adversity yes. of getting into the speaking business. Mm -hmm. If you could speak to anyone who is at that place that you were that had possibly fear or doubt about doing something like this, uh, what would you tell them? And what would their goals be, though? Uh, to be to build a successful speaking business. Okay. 
what I would tell them, well, first off, you have to reverse engineer everything, right? So you look at where you want to be, you look at what they did and copy what they did. Mm -hmm. And some of that works pretty well. Others as digital innovation happens, like emails used to work a lot better than they do now, but they still work, right? Mm -hmm. There or certain things on people thought Instagram would be great, but anyways, cutting through it on there, it's more of being able to reverse engineer one, two, understand that this is a long-term business three, actually understand how much people make. Yeah. If you're comfortable earning that much money and doing this for a living, then go at it. Yeah. One of the things that kind of knocked me off my chair was realizing if you're on the road, 50, 60 days a year, that's a lot. Like I have eight speaking engagements next month in person. Mm -hmm. And this is a month now, almost a month now after my surgery, right? For my broken leg. Yeah. So dude, I was six days after my surgery and the doctor was freaking out that I was broken <laughs> fibula on a plane. Oh. He's like, you couldn't get a heart clot. And I'm like, or blood clot. And I'm like, yeah. oh, well, I still got to get paid though. I got to get, <laughs> get paid. Like, I where am I going to tell you? I got a team. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what the hell is wrong with these people? It's like, this guy obviously doesn't have to work hard for a living. Shit. <laughs> Freaking doctor pulling in like 400K, not thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> 400K just off of, off of you. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, that, this was good. Um, final final words. Um, uh, where can the Thrive Tribe find you? Uh, you can find me at jeffjbutler.com. Just know that there's three J's, not two. Oh, on, jeffjbutler.com. Yeah, it's two J's. Sorry, I was thinking of my email address. Just remember that second J because Jeff Butler hates me. <laughs> the other one. Everyone sends him emails and he keeps sending me, stop sending me emails. And I'm well, like, just, dude. Just let me buy your name. Just let me buy the last name, bro. Come on. He's, <laughs> an, he's like an insurance broker that doesn't use his email at all. Don't you hate that? Don't don't you hate that? Everyone has a price, dude. I just gotta throw a big enough price one day at him. And hey, say, throw, yeah. throw 10K at him. I'm, I'm pretty sure maybe he'll, he'll budge a little bit. <laughs> All right, man. So we're getting ready to go behind the scenes real quick. Hey, I love this episode. Sure. Thanks so much. Sure thing.